Bo, and we are awful glad that you are here. Uh, we are continuing in our series on journeys. Uh, we're talking about Paul's missionary journey right now in the book of Acts, and uh, we've been going through that the last couple of weeks, and we are just really grateful for that. Uh, it's been a step-by-step -step process being able to see what the Lord uh, did through the early church and uh, what he's doing right now in our church, and we're grateful for that. And so if you've got your Bible with you and would like to follow along, uh, I say that every week on Wednesday night to the, uh, the middle schoolers and the high schoolers, and uh, all of them pull out their telephones. So if you want to follow along on your phone or if you just want to follow along on the screen, um, I will tell you this, I would encourage you to keep uh, your Bible with you at all times, uh, just so you know for sure that I'm not telling you something that's not true. Uh, one of the great things that we have is the ability to be able to read Scripture uh, for ourselves through the power of the Holy Spirit to be able to understand it. And today we're going to be in Acts chapter 18. And we're going to read verses 1 through 11 this morning. And let's see what old Apostle Paul was up to. And the word says, After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. And there he met a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had ordered all the Jews to leave Rome. Paul went to see them, and because he was a tent maker, as they were, he stayed and worked with them. Every Sabbath he reasoned in the synagogue. He tried to persuade Jews and Greeks. And when Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia, Paul devoted himself exclusively to preaching, testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah. But when they opposed Paul and became abusive, he shook out his clothes in protest and said to them, Your blood will be on your own hands. I am innocent from it. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. And then Paul left the synagogue and went next door to the house of Titius Justus, a worshiper of God. Crispus, the synagogue leader, and his entire household believed in the Lord. And many of the Corinthians who heard Paul believed and were baptized. And one night the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision. Do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent. For I am with you. And no one is going to attack and harm you. Because I have many people in this city. So Paul stayed in Corinth for a year and a half teaching them the word of Almighty God. Friends, this is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Almighty God, Lord, I thank you for your word that it does not go away void. I thank you, God, for the richness of Scripture, Lord, that fills our lives, that teaches us, that convicts us, that changes us. Lord, I pray this morning that you would empty me of myself and that your Holy Spirit would give me the words to speak. Lord, I pray that you would be with me and help me to know what to say. And I pray, God, that you would be with me and know when to sit down. I pray, Lord, above all, that you would be glorified and that your people would be ministered to. And we ask all this in the name of Jesus the Christ and all God's people said. Amen. Friends, the best way I can describe this chapter 18 is that it is like a yearbook for the first church in the city of Corinth. How many of you remember what it was like to have yearbook photo day growing up? Anybody? You remember having your photo taken? I know we've got some pictures of uh, my dad years ago when he was a senior in high school in 1973 and he's got long shaggy hair and a Fu Manchu mustache. He's got a, a, poly, or a polyester suit on, bell bottoms, and he was tough looking. For me, it was a special day having yearbook picture day because I got to pick out my own favorite clothes. I got to put Brillo cream. Y'all remember Brillo cream? 
I got to put some, some gel in my hair. I don't have too much hair to gel anymore that my wife tells me. Got to do my hair up nice and actually I just lied to you. Picture day for me was the worst. You know why? Because that was the day that mom would come in and pick out some starch, hard pressed shirt, some khakis that fit ill-fitting, a belt that was too big. I would have all this junk in my hair. Of course, fresh middle school acne was always present on those days when you didn't need it to be. In fact, I really believe that middle school yearbooks are really a huge conspiracy between parents and teachers to create blackmail to be used at weddings later on in life. Can I get an amen? Maybe you have blocked out that time period in your life, but I want to help you to recall how horrible it was. Okay, this morning, Miss Debbie's going to help me out. I found a few old pictures that I wanted to share with you today. Not only uh, that, but we kind of just got lost, me and Jackson, goofing around looking at old pictures and I thought some of y'all might get a kick out of these. Miss Debbie, will you pull those up? This is Beverly Hills uh, Elementary School. Uh, Bo is going into fifth grade with Miss Cress. Uh, my 10 year old will be in fifth grade this year. If you'll look right up there, the top right hand corner, uh, you can't really make it out, but I'm giving a wink to the uh, camera for some reason. I'm not really sure why that is. Uh, don't know if you can tell, but I do have my hair swooshed up like I'm a, a elevation worship pastor uh, and then uh, I'm ashamed to say this now I don't pull for them now but that is a Dallas Cowboys Super Bowl championship ring t-shirt that I'm wearing and uh, that was high dollar stuff uh, back in the early 90s all right how about the next one Miss Debbie this one down here is at um, first assembly in Concord in preschool I am four years old that is me right here in the bottom left-hand corner with the Mickey Mouse t-shirt on. I am as old as Bryson is right there. All right, how about the next one? This is me and a kid named Kayshawn Little uh, that grew up here in Albemarle. This is us at uh, summer camp 20 years ago at Johns River Valley Camp. Kayshawn is married and has a family. This is uh, me my first Sunday at our church's Baden and Oak Grove uh, almost 10 years ago. Again, uh, a lot less gray in the beard and a little bit more on top, looking sharp. All right, how about the next one? This is our first Christmas with Jackson. He looks identical to Bryson at that age. And uh, doesn't Jennifer look beautiful? Amen. All right. This is Jennifer and I when we worked on staff at Johns River Valley Camp 20 years ago. This is the summer we met. Kevin Russell, I picked this picture out just for you. I don't know if you recognize that, but that is a number four Jamie Barnett NC State jersey. Why I have that on, I don't know. Probably going to burn that picture when I get home, okay? Infuriate, Infuriate my father, all right? This is me and Jennifer in 2003 in January at Catawba College almost 20 years ago. Uh, we had started dating about a month before, and we are at the Winterfest Ball, and Jennifer wanted to do absolutely zero dancing. So we stood in the corner like flies because she was embarrassed and nervous. Amen? All right, next one. All right, this is when we found out we were pregnant with Jackson. So this is 11 years ago. I, I shared this on Facebook earlier, and I had a friend of ours from our old church that asked us if we were pregnant with number three, and I said, absolutely not. So... <laughs> All right, how about the next one? This is our engagement pictures. Jennifer hadn't aged a bit, and, and I look, I don't know what I'm doing there. So anyhow, all right. This is my senior year at the Concord High School, back when Concord football was really good. And uh, look how uh, handsome and beautiful mom and dad look. Uh, he's got the short hair now, uh, or there. He doesn't now. So anyhow, that's a beautiful one. How about the next one? That's me, uh, as it should be, with the Carolina T-shirt on, rocking and rolling. I'm about six months old right there, I believe. That's me again, my senior year at Concord. I look mean and tough. I'd give anything to be now as big as I thought I was then. This is me and my younger brother, Jonathan, on Easter Sunday, um, late 80s, early 90s, and I got the swooshed up hair looking tough. 
This is me on Lake Pillory with my mom. And when I look at some of the pictures of my boys, I could not deny them because they look identical to me. All right. This is us. Uh, that's me down there in the bottom corner making a face uh, on Christmas or uh, Easter Sunday morning pictures. Uh, I don't remember too much about this day because about 30 seconds after this, uh, Dad took me to the bathroom and, and I paid for that face right there. So this is my senior picture uh, that was in the yearbook, looking tough. That's me with the old uh, Dick Crumb Carolina football uniform on playing in the yard across from Concord High School at our house off Miramar. Just a couple of things I thought y'all might get a kick out of as we're talking about uh, yearbooks and talking about a snapshot, a moment in time. This chapter 18 of Acts is a snapshot. It's a moment in time of the early church. I want today to be an opportunity for you to zoom out of your day-to-day. -day. And if we were to take a snapshot right now of your life, and put it into a yearbook, what would we put in there? What are you giving your life to? Whether you are just starting out in life as a young adult, maybe you are a seasoned veteran, as you hear the story of this church, I want you to zoom out and to think about what you are giving your life to. Acts 18 introduces us to several people that will be integral in the early part of the church. We see what they were remembered for. And most importantly, we see a snapshot of how God accomplishes his plan, which is to make disciples, to make his son Jesus known. This chapter, we read through it very quickly, but this chapter represents about a year and a half of the early life of the Corinthian church. And there's a couple of things I want you to take away from. Number one, God accomplishes his plan through everyday people like you and me. God accomplishes his plan through everyday people. That's what this yearbook is trying to tell you. There is a God that has a plan for you in your life to make disciples and his intention is to use everyday normal people to carry it out. We're going to walk through this Acts 18 and see a couple of signs to know whether you are living God's plan for your life. The word says, after this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. If you've ever spent much time perusing the Bible, you will recognize that name Corinth because that's where the Corinthians live. Amen? Amen. The Apostle Paul wrote two letters to the Corinthian church that appear in the New Testament. Today we are seeing the early beginnings of that church that was so important to Paul and to his ministry. Verse 2 says he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus. He recently came from Italy with his wife Priscilla because Claudius the emperor had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. The first who show up in this Corinthian yearbook are Priscilla and Aquila. They've literally been kicked out of their home country under religious persecution, and they arrive in Corinth as refugees. This is where God's story in this church begins, with two refugees. Think about this for a moment. How God is going to use them begins with the total upheaval of their lives. How many of you right now might be going through a season or maybe you know someone that is going through a season in life right now that may seem on the outside looking in as if it were a total upheaval of their lives. People are dealing with disease, with sickness, with job loss, with cut hours with issues with school and family. But when life looked totally finished for Priscilla and Aquila, they were just in survival mode when they arrive at this new city, not knowing anyone. And God uses this chapter as a beginning 
to where he will use them in his infinite plan. That needs to be an encouragement and a challenge to some of us today. He takes what looks like a dead end and uses it as a new beginning. I want to ask you this morning, are you in a dead end situation? Has life maybe not gone the way you expected? Those are you that are working hard with your nose to the grindstone. Did you not get that promotion? Have you lost your job? I did a wedding last night for one of our dear friends, and one of the things that we talked about during the premarital counseling process was how they had so many broken roads that led them to each other. How many of you have had broken relationships to where someone had turned their back on you or dumped you again? How many of you have students or children that didn't get into the school they prayed that they didn't get into How many of you know someone that are literally refugees like these two? If you feel that way in life, that is great news. You want to know why? Because your plan might look like a dead end, but God is just getting started. God uses everyday people in everyday circumstances with everyday problems in everyday situations <coughs> to carry forward, excuse me, the greatest hope in all the world. And it's not just that God can use you, it's that he plans to use you. The word says, and Paul went to see them, and because he was of the same trade as a tent maker, He stayed with them and worked. He reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath, and he tried to persuade both Jews and Greeks. If you can imagine, Paul made tents during the week, talked about Jesus at night, and on his day off, he went and preached and taught. I thought about Brandon and Angela this week because the life of a church planter is not a glamorous one. It's a lot of hard work. It's starting from scratch. The word says when Silas and Timothy arrived in Macedonia, Paul was occupied with the word testifying to the Jews that Christ was Jesus. And when they opposed and reviled him, he shook out his garments and said to them, Your blood will be on your own hands. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. Finally, after this, the interns have arrived. Paul can devote more time to evangelizing. He puts down the tents and he gets to work every day for the church. I thought about this this week real quick. This passage says your blood will be on your own hands. That could come across as something very angry. Some folks will say share Christ with your friends and if they don't believe just look at them and scream your blood will be on your own hands. I haven't seen that one in any evangelism training tools lately. But lest you think Paul has compassion for these folks, remember these are the same Jews that Paul longs to see come to faith. But he knows that all he can do is share the gospel with them. One of the things that God has convicted me about in my own ministry over the last several years is that all I can do is present the gospel in the way I talk, in the way I live, in the way I show love to others. I can't make them accept Jesus, but I can do my best to show them Jesus. Paul feels a burden that unless he shares the gospel with them, he in some way shares in the guilt of their condemnation. Two chapters later, In chapter 20, Paul says, I testify that I am innocent of the blood of all, for I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. Paul knows that he cannot control someone else's response, but he can share the gospel message with them. Jonah 2.9, the word says, salvation belongs to the Lord. Not to Jonah, not to Paul, but God's plan for him is to declare Christ to them 
and that's Paul's yearbook bio. Do y'all remember when you were a senior in high school and somebody from the yearbook staff came by and said, what do you want your bio to say? What do you want your information about you to say? Paul's would be something like this, that he diligently preached to the Jews and the Gentiles to follow Jesus Christ. I want to ask you this morning, friends, do you share that sense of urgency that other people's souls are at stake and do we share the gospel with them, whether that's a co-worker, a family member, a child? That urgency in sharing the gospel is one of the things that we have got to take from Paul here. Verse 7 picks up and he says, And he left there and went to the house of a man named Titius, a worshiper of, of God, who means that he was a Gentile who was a believer. His house was next door to the synagogue, and Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord, and together with his entire household, as many of the Corinthians hearing Paul believed and were baptized. The next two pictures in the Corinthian yearbook are of these two men, Titius and Crispus, a Gentile believer and a Jewish believer. Titius puts his neck on the line by housing Paul, by welcoming into his home. And Crispus does the same thing just by being a synagogue leader who comes to faith. Both of these men risk a whole lot to believe Jesus. Titius is putting his neck out there. Crispus is as well. Their biographies might read, they gave up rec reputation and risked their careers to follow this Jesus. But friends, I want to tell you, that verse ends with some glorious, glorious news where the word says that many Corinthians believed and were baptized. That's the entire point of this whole chapter and really the entire book of Acts that God is doing extraordinary things through everyday people. I think that what God wants to show us in this chapter is that regardless of your background, regardless of your education level, regardless of your race or profession, God has a plan for you and it ends with people believing, repenting, being baptized, and offering their lives in sacrifice to Jesus Christ. Oftentimes we as preachers and believers put Paul on a pedestal. But if you think about it, Paul was an everyday guy. Look at these next three verses. Verse 9 says, And the Lord came to Paul one night in a vision and said, Do not be afraid, but go on speaking and do not be silent. For I am with you, and no one will attack you or harm you, for I have many people in this city who are my people. And he stayed a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. The first thing that God says to Paul is, do not be afraid. How many of you right now are afraid of something? You turn on Fox News and you see the stock market. You have savings that you've prepared for years. And because of the roller coaster of the economy, you're worried. How many of you have received a diagnosis from a doctor? And the doctor says it's not good. How many of you have received a message from a spouse or know someone that has that says, look, I don't feel close to you anymore. How many of you are hurting? God tells Paul, do not be afraid. Do you know why? Simply put, because I believe God was afraid. Or Paul was afraid, excuse me. In the first letter to this Corinthian church, 
Paul reminds them of how he came to them. He says, I came to you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. When I think about the boldness of the Apostle Paul, I don't think about weakness and fear and trembling. But he says in 1 Corinthians 2, And when I came to you, brothers, I did not proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom, for I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in the demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of Almighty God. How many of you this morning need to rest in the wisdom and in the power of Almighty God? Can I get an amen? Paul was afraid. He was scared. He'd already been beaten. He'd already been rejected. And I got news for you. I'm going to give you a little spoiler to the rest of the Bible. Paul's going to be beaten and rejected again. And this is very important. Paul isn't Superman. He's an everyday person just like you and me. When I think about Peter, Paul, James, some of these imperfect people that God used to further his message, and sometimes the seeming lack of faith that they had, and I think, God, how in the world could you use these people that had so many flaws? And then this morning when I was brushing my teeth, I look at my eyes in the mirror, and I see all the flaws I've got. And I say, okay, Lord, that's exactly how you did it. Because I want to be used just like Paul was. He's scared of what's coming for him, which should encourage us. Because Paul is an everyday guy with a nine-to-five tent-making job, trying to serve God during his free hours on Sunday and a fear of what following Jesus might get him into. When it comes to faith in Jesus Christ, there are no extraordinary people, just every people that God does extraordinary things through. And he has a plan for us. The most important thing that you've got to see here is something that we will circle back to. And that's how God speaks to Paul. I want you to be encouraged this morning. Because he gives him two promises and a command that are just as easily available for you and I today. What this entire chapter says, what it's pointing to, is very simple. That God accomplishes his plan through everyday people. His plan is to make disciples. His tools are you and me. Blue collar, white collar, redneck collar. Neighbors, clergy, interns, people with pretty stable career paths and people whose lives have been totally flipped upside down and they all have one thing in common, that they choose to live out God's plan for their lives. That's their yearbook theme, trading our plan for God's plan. So here's a question that I have for you today. What plan... Are you living for right now? What plan is guiding your decisions? What plan is influencing your relationships? Some plan is guiding, amen? Somebody's doing the leading. The question is, which one? I want to look back for just a moment through this chapter and show you a couple of signs that help us evaluate whether or not God's plan is our plan. Number one is this. Are you investing your life into others and not just yourself? When Paul moves in with Priscilla and Aquila, he works with them. We know from other places in Scripture that he develops a deep friendship with them. That's why he takes them to Ephesus when he leaves in verse 18. By the time he writes his first letter to the Corinthian church, Priscilla and Aquila are leading a house church in their home. 
he mentions them in three different letters. And then Priscilla and Aquila turn around and invest their lives into a man named Apollos who shows up at the end of the chapter. He was preaching and teaching about Jesus, but didn't yet know how the story ended. So when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they pulled him aside and explained to him the things of God in a more accurate form, the Bible says. We don't know if it was one conversation or if it lasted a couple of months, but they took their time away from their tent-making job to pass on to this guy what they had learned from the Apostle Paul. That's a sacrifice. If you don't build tents, you don't get paid. But God put someone in front of them, and because God's plan was driving their decision-making, they went for it. God's plan is to make all disciples, so that's what they went to do. Remember this little note, though, about Timothy and the intern arriving in verse 5. Timothy is watching Paul pass to Aquila and Priscilla, who then pass it on to Apollos. Sometime later, Paul, or Timothy gets a letter from the Apostle Paul that we now know as the book of 2 Timothy. And in verse 2, Paul says, What you have learned from me and trust into faithful people who will be able to teach others also. What you have learned from me, don't keep it to yourself. Pass it on. That's the plan. Give your life to teaching people who will teach others. Pass along the faith that has been given and entrusted to you. If you think about that yearbook that we talk about, how you are remembered is directly related to who and what you invested your time and energy into. What are you passing along? Who are you passing the faith along to? Now, I came up with a couple of small, obvious applications. Here, every week at church, during the week, we have small groups. If you, not, if you are not a part of one, one of the ways to grow in discipleship is to fellowship and learn with other believers. We are recruiting and training leaders so that we can start even more groups, so that you can jump into God's plan for your life and pass along the gospel message to others. Come and invest in this next generation. It is something that has been desperately impressed on my heart our kids especially our students need other adults not named mom and dad and grandma and grandpa that will spend their formative years walking alongside them passing along to this next generation what God has already taught you parents and grandparents let me speak to you for just a moment what plan are you living for? Do you really want to know what your life is all about? If you do, I encourage you this afternoon to sit around the lunch table and ask your kids this. What are the most important things in our family? Are they travel sports? Are they entertainment? Are there other activities? Or is growing in the faith of Jesus Christ at the center of our home? The qualification is this. If you are wondering if you are able, the answer is, are you willing to live for God's plan in your life and to pass on what he has done for you to others? Friends, I want to tell you, that's it. That's discipleship. I am choosing to give my life over to what God wants to do with it, to make my decisions and to build my relationships according to his word. And I'm going to take you along for that ride. For me, sometimes student ministry, even at my age, is the most daunting thing on the planet. I'm not that old, but after being a senior pastor, for the better part of a decade, stepping back into student ministry, I realized that I'm not as young as I used to be. 
But do you know what the secret of student ministry is? You really want to know what the secret is? It's called deodorant. Amen? I rediscovered that. Thank you for laughing at that. I appreciate that, some of y'all. I rediscovered how important deodorant was to students a couple of weeks ago when we went to summer camp with some of our kids because some of them do not know how to use it. Can I get an amen from the choir? Amen? Woo! After about four days, that cabin stunk to high heaven. But the other secret to student ministry is this. Giving to them what God has already given to you. And if that sounds scary, then perfect. Because that leads us to our second point. You find security in Jesus Christ, not in your own plan. Amen. Paul says in verse 9, The Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, Do not be afraid, but go on speaking, and do not be silent. For far too long in our society, in this country, and in our world, our churches have been silent for fear of opposing or offending someone else. The word says, for I am with you. I encourage you this morning to be bold in your witness. People can argue and debate theology. They can argue and debate soteriology, pneumatology. They can debate all these big million-dollar fancy seminary words. You know what they can't debate with you? Your testimony of what Jesus has done for you. God gives Paul two promises, presence and security, and he gives you and I the exact same two promises he says I am with you friends that equals presence and he says no one will harm you that equals security in the gospel you have the very same promises that God gave to the apostle Paul you have his presence Jesus promised in Matthew 28 and what we now know is the great commission one of my favorite pieces of recorded scripture Jesus promised us that he would be with us always, even to the end of the age. Y'all remember that passage? God's Holy Spirit is given to every believer, and Christ says he will be with us, and he will be in us. Not only do we have his presence, but God tells us we have security. Paul would later write in Ephesians 1 that when you believe the gospel, you are sealed with Christ. You are sealed with Christ until he comes back. And then Paul, who was hearing this promise, would later say again in Romans 8, what can separate us from the love of Christ? That's a rhetorical question. And the answer is what he continues to write. For I am sure that neither in height nor depth, nor depth nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. It's like Paul is remembering that moment in Corinth when God came to him in a vision as he's writing this promise to other believers. He is passing on to us what God gave him. Maybe you are here today and you know what I'm talking about. And you've been searching after some kind of security, but you've been running from his presence. Years ago, when he was very little, Jackson and I were at a friend's house, and we were watching a, a college football game. And my friend had a, a nice little dog. Actually, it was a gigantic dog. It was a Rottweiler. And Jackson, who is usually not scared of anything, especially dogs, he loves animals, but this moment he was surprisingly skittish. And so we get into this house, and I'm sitting in a chair, and beside me the dog comes running up with his tongue out, tail wagging, being friendly as can be. And Jackson jumps off my lap, and he runs as hard as he can away from me. And while he's running away, going the opposite directions, he's yelling, Daddy, 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 Daddy! And I had to tell him, 
son, I can't protect you if you run away from me. The safest place is for you to be right here next to me. And when I thought about that story this week, it reminded me of my own relationship with my father. Some of us are like this with God. Life has us so scared of something, and we are running away from the one person who can save us from it. We need to come to him who is greater than all of our fears. The great Baptist preacher, one of my heroes of all time, Charles Spurgeon, says, the fear of God kills all other fears in our hearts. The security we need is found in Jesus. But the problem is, is that oftentimes we run in the opposite direction. As believers, you and I need to rest in his salvation. He separated himself from his father so that we would never be separated from him again. That is what God is reminding Paul here. And that might be what we need to hear today. Lastly, number three, are we risking enough to need God's help? Are you stepping out on a limb? These two promises of presence and security are attached to something. Most of us want those two promises, that God is with us and that he will protect us, but, not, but God never gives us presence and security without calling us to action. A year ago, God called Brandon and Angela to step out in action in Kannapolis. He called Stacy to step out of his comfort and to help rebuild the church in Sand Hills. Every day, God calls us to step out in action and in faith. We want him to. We want to hear him tell us, I am with you, no harm will come to you. Now go do what you want to do. But that's not what he says. He never says that. God never gives his presence and his security without calling us to action. To Paul, God says, go on speaking. For the reason why I am with you and the reason no one will harm you here in Corinth is because I have many people who are my people. God had a plan for the Apostle Paul. His provision was for Paul and his plan. So here's my question. Is your commitment to the gospel causing you to risk anything? I'm not saying you have to step out and become a martyr. I'm not saying you have to step out and go overseas. But are you doing something that requires you to trust Almighty God with everything you've got? Are you in a place where you are saying, God, this is what you've called me to, so I'm stepping out? but I don't have any way of knowing that this is going to be successful unless you are the one that provides it. And that scares me, but I'm trusting you. Are you trusting him with what he's given you? Are you trusting him in what he's given you? What is God calling you to be a part of? One of my dear friends from our old church who was in his early 80s would tell me regularly, he would pick at me about being so young. This gentleman told me one time that he had underoos that were older than me. And I looked at him dead in the face and I said, brother, we got to go to the Marshalls or to TJ Maxx or to Walmart and we got to get you some new underoos. Amen? But he would tell me all the time, he would tell me all the time that he wants his greatest days of faith to be in front of him, not behind him. Regardless of what season you are at in life, your greatest days of faith can be in front of you and not behind you. As we close this morning, I'm going to skip all the way down to verse 24. The rest of the story, as Paul Harvey says, now a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was an eloquent man, competent in the scripture. 
He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus, though he only knew of the baptism of John. This guy, Apollos, was a smart and gifted teacher. One of those guys that maybe you didn't care that much for in school because he didn't have to study and still got straight A's. He wanted to use his intelligence and his teaching gift to honor God. He was passionate about it, but he only knew about the baptism of John and what Jesus would later come to do. Basically, he didn't have the whole story. He taught what he knew, but wasn't there yet. Unless we put him on a pedestal next to Paul, Paul would refer to Apollos and himself again in the letter to the Corinthians saying, What then is Apollos? What then is Paul? Servants through whom you believed as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. Apollos, like everyone else, was just a servant. God did not design the church to be a social ladder to climb the ranks in, but he gives every one of us the same value, different roles to accomplish his plan by pointing us to Jesus. Let me tell you this as we close. Your dreams are bigger than you. There is no way that Paul saw Apollos coming when he hung out with Priscilla and Aquila. It wasn't about their potential. It was about the gospel moving forward. I mentioned to you earlier about Charles Spurgeon. Spurgeon didn't come to faith by some eloquent pastor. He came to faith through a faithful shoe salesman in England. This is why this is so critical. God doesn't do things in your life just for you. Everything he does in your life is for accomplishing his plan of making and building disciples. I want to ask you again, are you living for your plan or are you living for God's plan? Because you will be astonished at the story you get caught up in when you give your story up. It is so much bigger and so much better than what you are dreaming of for yourself. One of the themes that we have had throughout this entire series on Acts is that God is doing something in you that will far outlast you. God is doing something in you that will outlast you to the next generation and the next generation. As the band comes back up on stage, I want to share with you one of my heroes of all time is a guy by the name of Jackie Robinson. I know we've got several baseball fans, me and Ryan especially are big baseball fans. Miss Debbie, will you put that picture up? Thank you. Many of you know uh, his name, but in 1947, Jackie Robinson was the first black player to play in Major League Baseball. And in uh, his first season with the Brooklyn Dodgers, in only the second road series of the season, they were playing a game in Cincinnati. And the Reds fans were giving Robinson a particularly tough time as the Dodgers took the field. They called him all kind of bad names and slurs. They were pelting things at him from the stands. And in a show of support, this guy on his left is a Hall of Famer by the name of Pee Wee Reese. And he temporarily left his position as the shortstop. And he came over to first base where Jackie was playing. And he put his arms around the rookie. And in doing so, it silenced the crowd, which was awed by this act of racial empathy by Pee Wee. Pee Wee Reese, this was almost like a homecoming for him. He was from nearby Kentucky. And in 2005, before her death, Jackie Robinson's widow, Rachel, recalled that moment saying, I remember Jackie talking about Pee Wee's gesture that day, and it came as such a relief to him that a teammate and the captain of the entire team would go out of his way in such a public fashion to express friendship and encouragement. What an awesome expression of kindness and support. What an encouragement to a friend in need.
The great pastor William Barclay once said, one of the highest human duties is the duty of encouragement. It is very easy in this day and age to discourage others. You can do it nameless and faceless behind a keyboard. People do it every day. This world is full of discouragers. We have a Christian duty to be an uplifter and an encourager to someone else. That's what Paul received from God, from Priscilla and Aquila, from Timothy, from Apollos. He received encouragement. And friends, that's what so many people need to hear from the church today, from us as believers. King David says in Psalm 10, You hear, O Lord, the desire of the afflicted. You encourage them and listen to their cry. Paul says in Romans 15, For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through endurance and encouragement of the Scriptures we might have hope. Ephesians 4, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building up others according to their needs, that it may benefit those that listen. Hebrews 10, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful, and let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. 2 Timothy 4, preach the word, be prepared in season and out of season, correct and rebuke with great patience and careful instruction, encourage. Throughout the last couple of chapters in Acts, we have seen Paul suffer greatly. In 16, after he healed the demon-possessed slave girl, he was dragged into the marketplace, stripped, beaten, flogged, and then thrown in jail. Last week, what Nate shared with us in verse seven, or chapter 17 in Thessalonica, a mob formed, tried to hunt him down so he had to escape secretly over and over and over. In Athens, he was mocked and ridiculed. It has been a rough ride for the Apostle Paul. But he has courageously pressed on, desiring to do whatever he could do to help bring salvation to God's people. Friends, I want to tell you, perhaps you have been going through a rough patch in life as well. I don't know everything going on in the lives of our families here at First Assembly, but I do know enough to be aware of many difficult life situations that some of you are going through. Health scares career difficulties, marital issues, financial crisis. The list goes on and on, and sometimes it doesn't feel like you are going to be able to keep treading water much longer. Friends, I want to encourage you today. God is not finished with you yet. I did this a few months ago at the benediction, and I wanted to do it one more time as a reminder. If you would, would you stand with me? And I want you to take your hand and I want you to place it over your heart. Since my health issues and my heart issues back in December, I have done this nearly every day just to be reminded that it's still beating. Do you feel that in your chest? Is your heart still beating? If it is, do you know what that means? that God still has purpose for your life. Today, I want you to be encouraged in whatever trial you might be facing. This, too, shall pass. Your life has purpose. And most importantly, you are not alone. Amen and amen. Almighty God, Lord, I just give you thanks. Be with my dear friends this morning. Remind us of your presence and your security. Father, Lord, convict us. If there is one that is hurting today, I encourage them to step out in faith. If there is one that is seeking you diligently, your word in Jeremiah 29 says, we will seek you and we will find you when we seek you with all of our heart. God, I encourage us to come to this altar to pray, to seek, to search, to be revived. 
to be reminded of your faithfulness. Great is your faithfulness. And all God's people said, Amen.